Hi, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're joining us online on this Sunday. We're delighted that you have taken time to be with Eastside in Marietta, Georgia. If you're part of our church family and not with us today, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And if you are new to us, we hope that you will come and visit us very, very soon. I tell you, you can communicate with us just about any way, from anywhere, if you will, if you'll just see the email there on the bottom of the screen, and just let us know that you're watching, communicating, and if we can serve you, if we can help you, let us know in that email. We'd love to pray for you and needs that you bring our way. We hope that you are supporting this church if you are a member or an inherent of Eastside, supporting us in your prayers, but also supporting us with your tithes and offerings, this local church. Uh, There are lots of different ways to give, including snail mail, but you can also give online. And there is an app that's available for you to not only give online, but you can also in your app application or downloading, you can get sermon outlines and scripture verses for every single Sunday as we teach the word of God which leads me to today. We continue today a series entitled Bait and Switch. It's the fourth Sunday of a six Sunday Sunday series where we're looking at the temptations, the snares, the traps of our enemy, the devil. Today we want to look at alcoholism and drug abuse. It's an interesting study in God's word and I look forward to you joining us in a matter of moments. We're thrilled you're here, glad that you're a part of our online experience. Let's worship the Lord together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain blowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they Blood of the Lamb. 
you be free from your passion and pride. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Since things are lost in its life-giving flow, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood. Precious blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Good morning or good evening, depending on when you're watching this online. We are delighted you've taken time to join us for the Word of God study time here at Eastside Church. And we hope that you'll come and see us very, very soon on Lower Roswell Road in Marietta in East Cobb County, Georgia. Well, we have been involved in a series called Bait and Switch. In fact, this is the fourth time, our fourth message, lesson in the series, Bait and Switch, which is subtitled, The Snares Are the Traps of the Devil. And the presupposition of the series is, is, is simply this, that oftentimes what our enemy will do is will tempt us with something that seems small and insignificant. The enemy will say, just, just taste that, or just touch that, just for a moment. It won't harm you, it won't hurt you. And if we're not careful, we can get so fond of that which we just barely touched or barely tasted that we can get so connected to it, it's like it, it can overwhelm our lives and be very costly. And the switch is this. The bait is it won't cost you much, but if left unattended, the switch is it'll cost you everything. There are people in life that have found that in their lives, they have lost just because they lightly were following some temptation. They eventually found that they lost their reputation, they lost their jobs, they lost their families. Now, as we begin this morning, there are two particular passages of scriptures that I would like to read with, with you today as we start. They were two verses that we ended with last week in our time together. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 12. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. When you think you have it together, when you think that everything is okay, be careful just in case, because it can trap you, it can cause you to stumble, it can cause you to fall. And then, in Proverbs, the 12th chapter, our section, Proverbs 12, looking at verse 11, it says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. And we used this particular verse last week when we were talking about the, the challenge of gambling or gaming, chasing a fantasy. And it can be true about this week's topic as we speak of the issue of substance abuse, chasing a fantasy, some type of high, some type of fix, some type of uh, ecstasy that you can't find in an ordinary human situation. Now, in this particular series, what we're doing is we're looking, as we did a few weeks ago, at the occult, the bait and switch there. <coughs> we also are looking at, as we did a few weeks ago, greed, and then last week, gambling. Today, we want to look at substance abuse. Next week, we'll look at various forms of sexual sin. This week, we look at substance abuse, and there are two arenas are two areas where you are, we are focusing today on this subject of substance abuse, 
<coughs> that is alcoholism and drug addiction. Both of these can take you into a fantasy and a feeling, <coughs> a sense or a euphoria that detaches you from reality, creating, if you will, another world or a parallel universe. And what we know is that these two areas, if you will, of substance abuse, they both intoxify, they both create a mood change, they both are roads or exits to escape, and it's very, very perilous. Uh, in my father's family, uh, there were many challenges related to alcoholism and to drugs. And uh, it was uh, for decades with that and another generation of my father's and the one after his, it proved to be incredibly challenging. And that may be your story, your family story as well when it comes to alcohol or drugs. Um, I am grateful in our country that there is a growing awareness of the danger of and the nightmare of alcohol and drug abuse. Yet there are also these contradictions in the country because we find that in our land of freedom and free speech and free markets and advertising, there are these gla uh, glaring contradictory messages of don't drink and drive, which is a great message, but in the same half hour of a television show, you may see um, a, a very glamorous commercial for a bourbon or a scotch to uh, encourage you to, to have a drink, uh, to pursue that for pleasure and for escape. Drug abuse itself has been and continues to be a, a problem in the country. We have a market of Americans who, who find themselves wanting to, to take drugs, who love to recreate with drugs, and suppliers know that. And suppliers, uh, creators of drugs, are always trying to find new cocktails of drugs, new blends of drugs to bring into people's lives to see if they can get them hooked. It's, it's so far-reaching and so accessible in our country today that I would imagine just within a few blocks of our church, maybe just a few houses away from our church, there are all kinds of drug purchase opportunities available. When it comes to illegal drugs, we know about cocaine in the 1970s and 80s. We know about meth and Oxycontin going into the 2000s. We know about ecstasy gaining hold in the culture in the same period of time. Heroin has been an ever popular drug of choice. And of course, there is always the, the ever present gateway to drugs that is marijuana. And it's mainstreaming into the culture and the increasing legalization of marijuana, which is something that we'll talk about in the coming days. Today what I would like to do and what I'm led to do is to talk about what I think is the quietest problem in the church. The quietest problem in the church, and I've been doing church work for over 40 years, and that quiet problem is a drinking problem. Let me uh, lighten the mood, if I can, with this humorous story. There was a story about a man who would buy four beers every time, four beers every time he visited the bar. He admitted that he had brothers in Europe and, and they had an agreement that whenever they drank, they would drink a beer for each other. Just one for the each of us, he explained. But one day this patron came in, sat on a bar stool and ordered only three beers. The bartender was sympathetic, suspecting that one of the men's brothers, one of the man's brothers had died, and he said, oh no, it's just that I've quit drinking. Jokes about drinking can make us smile, make us laugh, and when we see someone who is uh, drinking and acting out in their drinking, sometimes it can be quite, humanly speaking, quite funny. 
But in truth, we know that severe drinking, heavy drinking is not a, a laughing matter. Problem drinking is nothing to laugh at. Alcoholism in our country goes far beyond Skid Row. It goes far beyond someone who is just living on the streets. Alcoholism reaches the highest of the high in our society, and it can influence the most prominent leaders in the world. Functioning alcoholics, some pastor churches. Functioning alcoholics, some are accountants and insurance agents. Functioning alcoholics, some of them are medical practitioners. Some teach school. Some are your friendly neighbor. And some, they're your banker or financial advisor. Functioning alcoholics move in and out of their worlds without many people knowing about it. Sometimes even children of adult alcoholics are not even aware and can put together that one of their parents was a problem drinker until they become adults themselves. Now, let me, as I tried to do last week when talking about the issue of gambling or gaming, let me stay in my wheelhouse, which is, which is really confined to the teaching of the Scriptures. What does the Bible have to say about substance abuse? What does the Bible have to say about anything that is mind-altering? What does the Bible have to say particularly about about problem drinking, about alcoholism, about drunkenness. As a student of God's Word over the years, I find that the Bible has a lot to say about drunkenness, but not a whole lot to say about drinking. There's not a lot in the Bible to support total abstinence from drinking. There is encouragement, though, do not get drunk. There is encouragement to stay sober. There is encouragement to not lose one's mind. But abstinence from total drinking is, is a tougher biblical case to make. My father who was a preacher, as many of you know, and others before him said it well. Here is the issue, though. The present-day alcoholic problem drinker always began what would be their journey with the first social drink. And the fact is, once you take that first drink, you do not know how your body will respond, how you will respond to that being within your system. The Bible has a lot to say about heavy drinking, a lot to say about drunkenness, not as much to say about abstinence. So I would encourage you do not judge those who drink their glass of wine. But I do encourage you to remember the very first verse that I read to you today, and it is this. Take heed, lest you fall. The Bible has a lot to say about heavy drinking. As it is today, drinking alcoholic drinks, fermented drinks, as it was, is today, it was true in biblical times. It was true during the times of the Lord Jesus. It was true in the days of the Old Testament. So what does the Bible have to say about heavy drinking, about drunkenness, about the problem of problem drinking? Well, what we know from the Bible, first of all, is that drunkenness... <clears throat> is a judgment of God. You say, what? Yeah, drunkenness is a judgment of God. In the book of Isaiah, 
beginning at chapter 5 and looking at verse 11 through 13, here is what God's Word says to people. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks and who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine. But they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. It's the judgment of God. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Those who pursue a drunken lifestyle, those who are drunks, problem drinkers, consume with drinking, they have the judgment of God upon them. Now, this is not only true in Isaiah, but it is also true in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 13, here's what God says to Israel. Say to them, that is what the Lord God of Israel says. Every wineskin should be filled with wine. And if they say to you, don't we know that every wineskin should be filled with wine? Then tell them, that is what the Lord says. I'm going to fill with drunkenness all who live in this land, including the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and those living in Jerusalem, I will smash them one against the other, parents and children alike, declares the Lord. I will have no pity, no mercy, or compassion to keep me from destroying them. What God does here is God sends a curse of drunkenness on the people because of their judgment, because of their rebellion. God sends judgment. So drunkenness is seen as a, as a judgment of God. It's not seen in a positive way. Let me, let me give you another thing that the Bible teaches about drunkenness and is found in Proverbs. Proverbs, the 29th, 23rd section, 23rd chapter, Proverbs 23, beginning at verse 29. Drunkenness leads to sorrow. Listen to this. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging, saying, they hit me, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I do not feel it. And when I wake up, when can I find another drink? Now, what these verses do here, beloved, is is basically provide warnings to us, sayings to us, to stay away from problem drinking. And it also speaks to us about the benefits of sobriety, the benefits of staying sober, the benefits of being aware of what is going on around us. So the writer says, stay away. God says, stay away. And if you stay away, you'll never look back and regret the day you took your first drink. Andy Stanley here in Atlanta said this, and it's a a loose quote, but it's pretty much what he said, as I recall. He said, he said, from my personal experience, I've never met Someone who said, my life was really going in the wrong direction until I started drinking. My life was really going in the wrong direction until I started drinking. Never met a person like that. Because what happens with drinking, 
You continue to drink enough and you turn into the person that the Lord never intended you to be. And the reality is that I guess every single one of us who watches this knows of someone whose life that has been destroyed by alcohol. There's no way to adequately add up the damage of what an alcoholic problem drinker's life can cost. And I'm not just talking about the money spilt, spent on the, on the drinks. There's the damage that it causes to relationships and marriages and family. And so to the, to the problem drinker and to the family of the problem drinker, it can be quite devastating. So we have to, have our, have to ask ourselves a, a question. Is there a, is there a path out of this darkness? Is there a way out of this life of being dependent, having your personality change, pursuing some kind of high or escape because of excessive alcohol? Let me offer some. The first step toward freedom begins with the spiritual. It begins with a cleansing by God. Alcoholics Anonymous has been very, very successful in trying to bring people out of a dependence on alcohol. And they have the famous 12-step program. And of the 12 steps, six of those 12 steps all revolve around the power of God in one's life. Number two of the 12 steps, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves and to, uh, to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Number six, we were, were entirely, all, all re entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Number seven, we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Number 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for his will and his power to carry that out in my life. And number 12, having had a spiritual awakening of these, as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. All of these are referring to a spiritual cleansing by God. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. If you want to have some degree of true peace, if you want to have some degree of true hope, if you want to have some degree of true healing, it begins with the cleansing power of God. Now the second step toward freedom is that the problem drinker has to come out of hiding. The problem drinker has to come out of hiding. Uh, this opens the door for help. If you are keeping this a secret, if you're keeping this as something that you don't want anybody else to know, you're not going to get the help you need. You've got to come out, step out of the darkness into the light to open the door for forgiveness, <coughs> to open the door for restoration. Now let's go to the third step. The third step is becoming accountable. That's beginning to share with people your story, saying that you need help getting treatment, admitting that you have a problem and getting with a people, a group of people <coughs> that are engaged to help you in the journey. The fourth step is finding, if you will, a, a replacement for the substance. And the place we begin as Christ followers is we begin with the Lord, we begin with God. There's some fantastic scriptures here 
that can encourage you and help you as you are trying to move toward recovery. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You replace the substance with the Spirit of God. In Colossians, one book over, pardon me, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 18. He says this, does the Apostle Paul, he says in verse 16, not verse 18, that would be Galatians 5, 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There is something to be said about the dependence of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you know Christ, the Holy Spirit to help you through the problem drinking. Yes, there needs to be accountability. Yes, there needs a, a facing reality to come out of hiding. Yes, there needs to be a cleansing by God. But there needs to be an ongoing sense of the Holy Spirit empowering you to get through the challenges of overcoming. Now, the fifth step is to understand that this is all for the Christian spiritual warfare. It's all spiritual warfare. In Colossians chapter um, 2, Colossians 2, and looking at verse 13 through verse 15, here's what he says. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Last verse. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Here's an important point to remember in all of this. This verse teaches that no matter how strong the sin, the cross is stronger. You can be delivered. And with the combination of the, the power of God, the power of Christ working in you, dependence upon the Holy Spirit, and admitting and confessing where you are and that you need help, there can be deliverance with accountability to get you to the other side of this issue of problem drinking or of drug addiction. Now, I started by saying that this really is, if you will, the kind of the quiet, the quiet sin in the church. But it goes on. It exists. And people that are here worshiping on this Lord's Day, doing the best they can to get through this service, that even in the parking lot maybe needed a drink before they came in. This is real. And a church needs to be a community where we can work through these things together. And if you have a problem with drink, if it is becoming so evident to loved one and family members, even before that, you, you, it's a secret. You need help. And what we don't want to be a place is where you feel that you can't talk about this, where you can't share it. I, I wish that you would get in touch with me and let's together figure out a strategy and a plan to get you to the other side of the problems of drinking and drug abuse. The series is called Bait and Switch for a reason. For the, the drug user, the drug abuser, it began with the first recreational drug. It started somewhere. For the alcoholic, the drunk, it began with one social drink. That was the bait. Try this. Taste this. You'll like this. That's the enemy. 
The switch, though, is over time, if you've allowed it to begin to control your life, the switch is that it can cost you everything. It can cost you your health. It can cost you your family. It can cost you your job. It can even cost you your life. So I hope that today you'll be encouraged and not feel judged, that you'll feel loved and you'll feel accepted, and that you will work toward allowing the Lord to help you overcome. Pray with me, would you please? Father, today we confess that alcoholism and the drug addiction, that this is sin, that these are sins. And Father, we pray for those who are our friends, who are overwhelmed by it, for those who have become its slave. We are weary today to believe Satan's lies. And we pray, Father, today that we would get rid of the secrecy, get out of bondage, and no longer allow our bodies to be misused in this way. Your word says, do not get drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. May we accept the control of the Spirit rather than the control of the drink or the drug. We affirm today that we are your child, that we are loved by you despite of our failures, and that you love us enough to stop our slide into total ruin. We admit that when we have turned to alcohol or drugs to solve our problems, we have believed a lie. But we also acknowledge that we've lived a lie to cover up sin. So Father, would you help us to confess and forsake all sins that are accompanied by alcoholism or drug abuse. And by your grace, help us to be reconciled to the people whose sin, by my sin, I may have affected. I humble myself today to seek the help of those who can stand with me against this. I submit myself today to their counsel and their authority. And may, Father, your power and my desire to get this wrong made right be long-lasting. I love you today, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and thanks for watching.